Good morning, St. James! Happy Pentecost! Let me, let me take my earbuds out, because I know for a fact anyone watching at home had a bigger reaction than we had here, because I didn't hear anything in here. Happy Pentecost! It's hard to imagine that we could have more power while we're walking the face of this strange earth than Jesus showed while he walked this strange earth. But he gave us a promise. He gave us just that promise. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can walk in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing can get in our way. No one can get in our way. And we can walk on the rock, which is Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I invite us this morning, let's rise with welcoming hearts to invite the Holy Spirit to interact with us here today. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on at just the voices. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit, we invite you to fall afresh on us. We invite you to fill us. We invite you to overwhelm us with the love of God, with the peace of God, with the calmness of God, <laughs> and strengthen us with the joy of the Lord. Holy Spirit, move in this place. We invite you to move freely in this place. Father God, may your will be done. Jesus Christ, may your works be done. Holy Spirit, enable us to walk in you. There's nothing better than being in your presence, God. And we just thank you for allowing us to come in. We invite you. We invite you. We invite you. There's nothing worth more that'll ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free 
and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome to come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what I Welcome to St. James. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're here to worship our God. And Jesus said that where two or more are gathered in his presence, there he is, or in his name, rather, there he is. That's a beautiful promise, but we miss something in that, and that is that we have the honor and the privilege 
of ushering the presence of Jesus Christ into a place. So I want to say thank you for being here this morning in person and online because Jesus came with you and we get to worship him. I'm Eugene Scott, one of the pastors that's honored and privileged to serve this community with you, and it's really good to have you here this morning. I don't know if you walked outside and had your eyes open, but what a glorious morning. I, doesn't God ever get tired of just renewing the day and making every day beautiful? I, it, it, it's, just, it's just amazing. There are a few things happening in the life of our congregation that uh, you'd like to get maybe get involved in, and uh, two ways for you to get more information than just listening to me, and that is on the screen, but probably better is on the website, because then you can actually just take notes and, and write things down. One thing that we didn't get on the screen is that next Sunday we're going to have a time of remembrance for those that we've lost this past year in our families and friendships. And if you uh, want to participate in that, please send a picture in, uh, if you have one, of your loved one to Becky at Becky uh, at sjpres.org, and we'll organize those into a time of remembrance for next Sunday. Uh, today, uh, from noon to 2, you get to drop off... Um, those items listed up there on the screen or probably on your screens at, at home as well for the Network Coffee House. That's one of the ways we participate in ministering to people in our city, in our community. There's also a concert <clears throat> tonight, and there should be there, uh, the Spring Musicale. Is that the right way to say that? I don't know. You don't know? Okay, all right. <laughs> Spring ahead with us, and, and there you go. And... Um, as Ernie reminded us, and as those of you who actually wore red and have red reminded us as well, that today is Pentecost Sunday. And I, I wanted to, to remind us how powerful an image fire is in Scripture as we go to worship God. In Exodus chapter 3, that familiar story of, of God speaking from a bush on fire, and Moses says to him, here I am. And God repeats or says back to him, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Notice it wasn't in a sanctuary built in the 1990s. It was in God's sanctuary, original and creation. And instead of asking Moses to get dressed up in his Sunday best, he actually tells him to undress, to become more vulnerable. Annie Dillard, one of my favorite authors, wrote this. On the whole, and you can see that on the screen as well, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. You can tell what, time, what age she wrote this in. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may wake some day and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. Let us worship a God of mercy, a God of grace, but a God of danger. This is not a safe place, but rather a sacred and a holy place. Heavenly Father, forgive us our blithe ignorance. God, it's a good thing that ignorance is curable by your presence and your power. We gather in your name. We gather, lay 
tongues of fire on us this day that we can know you and serve you better. Let us worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're excited this morning to uh, uh, ordain and install deacons. We did that a couple of weeks ago with elders, and I want to invite uh, the new deacons who are being ordained and installed uh, to come up here uh, on the, on the uh, chancel and to be able to face the congregation. Vicki Cantrell, Kathy Clark, Ann Cleveringa, Tom Hewitt, Nancy Nagy, and continuing is Jenny Burry and Nancy Oltman. Talk about a home for deacons. This is amazing and cause for us to celebrate this Pentecost Sunday as these dear brothers and sisters serve us so well uh, as our deacons. And so uh, we uh, enter into this as a covenant that they make promises as they enter into this and we make promises to them as Sandy will lead us in in a moment. And the questions we ask are the same questions that are asked of pastors and elders uh, with one exception, there's a specific deacon question, but uh, so we invite you to enter into this. Don't just listen, enter into what is taking place here. Uh, and at the end, I will simply say, if so, say I will or I do, and you can repeat, repeat um, the tops of your lungs, right? <laughs> do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him, Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Okay. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, say, I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Amen. Great. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit? If so, say, I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace and unity of the church? If so, say, I will. And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? After they asked me that question here at St. James when I was ordained in 1990, I stumbled because that's a, that's a hard question, isn't it? With, <laughs> with all the energy, intelligence. Uh, we're, we're going to pray for each other in that one, correct? <laughs> for deacons, the last question. Will you be a faithful deacon teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendly, friendless and those in need. In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If you will, say, I will. And now for the congregation. Please stand. Do we, the members of the church, accept Tom, Vicki, Nancy, Kathy, Anne, Nancy and Jenny, as deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? We do. Now let's enter in a time of prayer because none of us can keep these vows. 
Only the Holy Spirit can empower us to do so through his grace. If you are a deacon or elder elected in any church uh, previously, will you please extend your hands as a symbol of laying on of hands of these new servants. And we ask, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would empower these fine people not only to keep the vows that they have upheld before us this morning, but, Lord Jesus, that you would continually transform them and us through them as they bring care to our congregation, to our community. God, we ask as a congregation that we would care for them as well, that we would mutually submit to caring and loving one another just as you care and love us. And God, we pray that as these fine people minister, that people would come to know you not only through words, but through their deeds, through the mercy that you pour out from them to us. God, protect them. Be with them. Sustain them. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Can we welcome them to their role as deacons? <laughs> Thank you all. Oh, I see you sitting. Let's remain standing and worship God and praise his name. We were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake we died praise the you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the death rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the soul of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born in the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old it shall not yield it shall not fade by the blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ 
Happy Pentecost. Would you, uh, oh. try it again? We gotta do it again. Happy Pentecost. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Thanks, Ernie. Would you please, my name is Craig Thai. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the associate pastor. And would, would you please join me in prayer? Almighty and gracious God, when Christ ascended into heaven to reign with you in power and glory, you sent the spirit of truth to guide us into the way, the truth, and the life of Christ. Let your spirit, our advocate, guide us still, preserving us from judgment, protecting us from sin, and leading us into righteousness so that we may testify to the good news, fullness of life and joy for all through Jesus Christ our Savior and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we, we ask you today to bless our congregation in this place of worship. We specifically lift up our ministry partners, both local and international, that they may stand firm in the sharing of the gospel. We pray for those in our community and our congregation that are sick. Lord, we ask you to heal them, to care for them, and to fill them with your grace. Let us now take a moment for private prayer and confession. And now, Lord, may we pray the way you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be I was going to I was going to use this microphone and then I realized I don't know where to stand so I'll just use this microphone. <laughs> Hi everybody. Okay, so we're back. Hi. Happy Pentecost. Happy Pentecost. Woo! I got it the first try. Okay, so this is Jackson as you well know and we are going to talk about ancestry today. I wanted to check. I see a group of young humans over this way looking for other young humans. I'm gonna ask the ones who are watching online right now too, who, who knows what the word ancestor means? Raise your hand. Yes, okay, we have some yeses. So ancestor basically is not your parents or your grandparents, but the people who made the people who made the people who made the people who made your grandparents, who made your parents, who made you. So people that you came from, from a very long line back. And Jackson and I wanted to do an experiment 
and see what the ancestry is of this congregation. So I'm gonna throw some different sentences at you in different languages, and I want you to either raise your hand or stand up if that's your ancestry, and Jackson will help you figure out what the language is since he apparently now speaks five languages. No, I don't. <laughs> so, that's not true. Okay, so. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the first one is, I can say this one, I have to use my app, some of them I can't speak them, but this one is, hola, hablo espanol. Okay, so who here, who here speaks Spanish and has ancestry from Spain? I see one over there. Okay, the next one I'm definitely going to use. Yeah, Jackson, you got some yeses over there. I'm definitely going to use my app for this one because I don't trust that I'll be able to say this right. I hope my speaker can play it. What about microphone? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Let's try this then. Sorry. Can you guys hear that? One more time for the crowd. I don't dare try to speak that language myself. I'll just butcher it. So Jackson, which one's that? Who here has ancestors from China? Anyone? Okay, nobody here that we can see. All right, the next one I'm also not going to try to speak. This one is She takes a second. Ich spreche Deutsch. Which one's that, Jackson? Germany. Ooh, whoa, look at this crowd. What? Sprachen Sie Deutsch. Okay, lots of ancestry from Germany. Okay. All right. And we have one last one. I confess this one's for Wayne. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm accurate. And I can actually speak this one a little bit. It is, bonjour, je parle français. Is that, okay. <laughs> Jackson, which one's that? Who here has ancestors from France? Right, okay, good. Okay, we have some, some French in here, okay. And Jackson just found out that some of his ancestry on his dad's side comes from both Mexico and Native American lines. And what we thought was interesting is you can tell that if we put our arms next to each other, his skin is darker than my skin, which you can tell comes from his ancestry. Mine is lighter than daddy's. Right, his is lighter than daddy's. I'm part Italian, too. Yeah, so, so, so why are we talking about ancestry today? We're talking about it because, as you all know, it's Pentecost Sunday. And for the kids, Pentecost Sunday was when the Holy Spirit came down from heaven and filled all of Jesus' disciples with special powers and the ability to speak different languages and go all over the world and preach God's word to all these different places. So that kind of reminds me that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And we have special abilities and skills. And no matter how different our skin color is or our eye or hair color, or where we're from, what languages we speak, we're still made in the image of God and we're still special in the eye of God. So let's pray. <laughs> Dear God, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit and for giving us these gifts and your Son. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I think Jackson should do this part. <laughs> Thank you, Jackson. Absolutely. Good morning. It's so good to see everyone. I would like to tell you a story, kind of like our ancestry. I love that. A story of St. James, past, present, and future. Way back in 1997, or so, a group of women known as the Finishing Touchers, K. Lois, Verna Lee, and Isla, and others knew about families who were at risk for or who were experiencing homelessness, who needed shelter and meals. Family Promise was established here at St. James by these women. 
For a week, about four times a year, St. James became home for the homeless, home for Jesus. The finishing touchers found others. I say Jesus, and it makes me cry. <laughs> yeah. Holy Spirit, thank you. The finishing touchers found others to come alongside and help with their mission. And during the last few years, Jan Falks took that early vision and continued to organize volunteers here at St. James to meet the needs of homeless families. Thank you, Jan. I don't know if you're here this morning, but thank you if you're at home. Today, and since COVID, Family Promise is providing housing for homeless families in a home downtown and in hotels. St. James volunteers provide meals four times a year for a few days at the home downtown, and that's happening this week. I know Kate's doing a meal. Thank you. Thank you, St. James, and thank you, volunteers. So this story has a beginning. It has a middle, and I hope many new chapters. Families still need temporary ho housing and hot meals. In the past, women had a vision of being the hands and feet of Christ. Today, many continue that vision of compassion for homeless family, families and provide meals. Today, many continue, oh, I already said that, now the future is coming and we can see it we are here meeting in person today yay our community is becoming safer and family promise and homeless families will return to st james this coming fall there is time to write the next chapter of this story and i'm here to ask and to challenge you to be the next author of the next chapter of Family Promise here at St. James. I know God will call you. And you will answer. You will write the next chapter of this story started so long ago by those who heard the call and answered. Four times a year, you write the story or you write the chapter and it's done until the next time the families arrive and you get to tell the story again. Contact me, I'm Mary, Sally Stewart, Jan Fowkes, or Pastor Wayne, or email Becky at St. James. She has the ministry description. If you have any questions, or if you need to know more, or if you just know the Holy Spirit has laid upon you and you're ready to answer, the story will continue through you. God will call you. I know it. Will you answer? I think so. And now, my friends, it's time for the offering.
It is so great uh, to be together. We're glad that you are here more and more every Sunday gathering together. And for you who are joining us online, we're so glad that we can gather together and worship on this Pentecost Sunday. Did you hear it's Pentecost Sunday today? Absolutely. Look at that. That's awesome. And the Holy Spirit is still active and at work. You know, as we dive in, I want to remind us that we are in the middle of a series looking at what are the practical implications of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago for our lives today. What difference does it make that Jesus rose from the dead bodily 2,000 years ago on the other side of the planet for your life and my life today? And we've seen many different implications. And over these next uh, few weeks, we're going to be looking at some that may surprise you. Implications that we often don't put together or connect with the resurrection. And today, for example, we're looking at the topic of racism. That Jesus, bodily, his death and bodily resurrection says something directly about racism and the reality of racism in our world. Now, for some people, that surprises us. We say, what if, wait, that's not why I'm here. Some people, there, there's an excitement when we hear that. We say, oh, that's great. I want to hear that. Others say, that's not why we're here. That's, what does that have to do with my faith and Jesus rising from the dead? And yet you might be surprised to discover that it is more difficult to find a New Testament book that does not directly deal with racism because of the resurrection than to find one that does. That almost every book in the New Testament addresses this topic in light of the resurrection of Jesus. 
And so for us, it becomes this wonderful discovery of what difference does Jesus' resurrection make in light of many issues that we're facing today in our world. Now, as Paul is writing uh, his letters, and we have these books in the Bible, he's writing to specific churches who are addressing different challenges that they're facing. And as he's writing, he's writing letters to specific churches. So he's writing, for example, a letter, the book of Ephesians, is writing a letter to the church in a, in a city called Ephesus. When he wrote Philippians, he wrote a letter to the church in a little village or town called Philippi. When he wrote First and Second Thessalonians and First and Second Corinthians, he was writing letters to specific churches in Thessalonica and Corinth. And yet, today we're looking at the book of Galatians, one of the many books where he addresses this issue, and yet it's not just to a specific city, it's actually to a region. So if we see on the map here, for those who are able to see here, that, uh, that Galatia was an entire region where there were several churches that Paul had planted and that had been planted. And so we have Israel or Middle East on the, on the right there, Egypt on the bottom. We have Italy on the left where Rome and the seat of the Roman Empire was. And then we have that region of Galatia uh, that exists there where there were different churches. Now the Roman Empire... Uh, was established and built by the Romans conquering one country after another, one people group after another. And so you have the one Roman Empire, but it's actually made up of different nationalities, different ethnic groups, different races. And it is not an exaggeration to say that they had a hard time with each other. That yes, they were all in the Roman Empire, but there were all these different races and ethnic groups within the Roman Empire who struggled in their relationships with each other. They looked down on each other. They hated each other. There was hostility with each other, and not the least of which were the hostilities that existed between Jews and Gentiles. A hostility that continues to this day as we gather here with the fragile ceasefire that exists between Israel and Palestine. Those hostilities were real. And yet the resurrection, the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus addresses it head on in a way that nothing else can. You see, we cannot legislate our world out of racism. That that, uh, politics is not the ultimate answer. It might be helpful, there might be helpful laws. Politics is not the answer to racism. Sociology isn't the answer to racism because the problem of racism, the root of racism is spiritual. It is at the heart. And it is only in the transformation of the human heart that we see hatred and we see hostility And we see racism dealt with once and for all. And Jesus Christ is the one who brings that. And so with that, we dive into our passage in Galatians chapter 3, just a few verses. And and what's exciting about these verses is that we know Paul's writing very often because when he writes his letters, he often starts with a theology. He'll start by laying out a foundation of theology. Here is the truth about God. Here is the truth about Jesus. Here is the truth about the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know this from the depth of your heart. And then he turns a corner. There's a hinge where then he says, because all of that is true, here are the practical implications. And some of the most exciting parts of Paul's letters are the hinge, what I call the hinges, when he's moving from the theology to the practical part. And this is a great example of that. And very often, Paul just breaks out in a song in these sections uh, in, his, in his letters. But here in, in uh, chapter 3, verse 26, 1 through 3 is laying out the theology, 4 through 6 is his practical applications. And here in verse 26, so because Jesus died on the cross and is risen from the dead, So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you, the word all is important, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed 
and heirs according to the promise. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, thank you for your word. Thank you for its timeliness. Thank you for its urgency. Thank you for the way that your Holy Spirit is present and at work, transforming our hearts. And God, we pray that you would do a renewing work in us, that you would open us up from our blind spots, that you would transform our hearts to deepen our love, that we can represent who you are and what you are about in the world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, we cannot legislate our way out of racism in the world. We cannot um, have enough social movements uh, we, uh, or efforts to try to just change or even shame people out of racism that, that when, when there is hostility between one group of people and another, the only tra- way that we can address that is the transformation of the human heart. Now, by racism, I want to say that racism is any time a group of people are devalued, denigrated, or discriminated against by another. Let me say that again. Racism is any time a group of people is devalued, denigrated, or discriminated by another. Now that other might be an individual or it might be another whole group of people and we see ways that both of those things happen. And when we look around our world, uh, we may think from our own experience or life experience, oh, is racism that big of a deal? But all of a sudden, I mean, I find that we can't look anywhere without seeing uh, signs of it. That we live in a time that uh, this very week, marks the one year from when George Floyd was killed. Now, whatever you may think about the events leading to George Floyd's death, whatever you think about the events that have followed George Floyd's death, what the events did is raise the issue to a higher level of awareness of the possibility that racism exists in our culture and world. We cannot ignore it, not only in our own country, but around the world. Tim Keller says that over 15 million people uh, participated in the protests that existed just in our own country. That there, it, it raised the, and it elevated the awareness of the dynamic of racism. But as, as I also said, it is not just an American thing. That racism has existed since the beginning of time, and we see it take place around the world. We have the Israeli and Palestinian conflict that is taking place right now, and it is just smoldering. We see the, the, the uh, concerns and challenges and frustrations people feel uh, with uh, not just um, the Black Lives um, Matter movement, but also just the statement, and there is a difference between the Black Lives Matter statement and the Black Lives Matter movement, but we also see the concerns about uh, issues related to uh, Latin, people of Latin American descent and the challenges that we're addressing on the borders. And if that's not enough during the coronavirus, we have this elevated experience of what is being called Asian hate. And it seems like everywhere we turn, there are these challenges of racism, or at least hostility between people, where people feel devalued, denigrated, or discriminated against by other people. Now, Christians can respond in a couple of different ways. We can say, well, it's just being overblown, it's being exaggerated, it's not that big of a deal, and we can stick our head in the sand. Or, in light of the resurrection of Jesus, we can name it for what it is, and we can be on the leading edge, as Christians have throughout history, of being able to push back on the forms of racism that exist in our own community, in our own country, and in the world, because Jesus is risen. And so what we find in our passage is that Paul actually lays a foundation of how we can think about this, how we can think about other people in light of our differences. So we can look at this in the matter of race, but we can also look at this in how people are different from one another. I was tempted to say, hey, let's just do a little survey. What are different ways that people are differentiated from other people. 
And in our own country, I won't take the time to do that, but we can come up with a lot of different creative ways that we are different from one another. And many of those raise our emotions. Many of those raise tensions. It might not be race or ethnic differences or cultural differences. It could be, say, politics, red and blue, Republican, Democrat, and we vilify and look at other people differently. We value people differently. We respect or view people differently. And so Paul lays out a foundation of however it is that we might devalue, denigrate, or discriminate against others. He lays out a foundation of how Christians are called to look into this, to look at this. Secondly, how Jesus' death and resurrection makes all the difference in the world in how we address it. And then lastly, some practical implications, how we live into it. First of all, very simply, Paul lays out the foundation of how we think about this. First, in verse 26, he says, So in Christ Jesus you were all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, and interestingly, he says, and have clothed yourself with Christ. He's talking to the Christians who were in the churches in Galatia, Christians who were Jews and Gentiles, Christians who were from different ethnic backgrounds, who were struggling to relate to each other. I mean, when we relate to each other differently outside the church, but those same people come together and gather together, how do we relate to each other when we bring those different backgrounds into the church, into the community? And he says, you are clothed with Christ. And what he's talking about here is that we not only see who we are in our individuality, but we are all in Christ. We put on Christ, as Paul talks about a lot, that we put on Christ and that Christ has transformed our lives, that he has cleansed us from sin, that he has transformed us to make us new, that we are in Christ by his grace so that when God sees us, he no longer sees our sinful selves, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. And so when we see one another with all of our faults, with all of our uh, differences, we can not only recognize those differences, but even more importantly, we see our unity that we are clothed with Christ, that we are made in the image of God. And see, this is the very foundation of it. Before anything else happened, in Genesis chapter 1, as God's creating all that exists, and at the very pinnacle of his creation, he creates humanity, he creates people, he creates women and men. And what does God say? The triune God says, let us make man, humanity, in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over fish in the sea and birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind. God created all of humanity in his own image. Just if we didn't get that, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Repeated again and again and again. You are made in the image of God. The emphasis here is that when you look in the mirror, you represent, you display something of the likeness of God, the image of God. You are of infinite value because you reflect the very value in the nature and the image of God himself. And not just you. Yes, you. Don't let anybody discount that. Don't let anybody discount that truth about you but it's of every single person you and I interact with. Every single person, that guy that cuts you off on the freeway, that annoying lady in the store, that person that annoys you the most, that person of a different race and life experience and ethnic background, that person of that other political party, even they are made in the image of God. That's our starting place. 
we don't get there after going through the layers and letting those political and other uh, things become filters to finally say, okay, and maybe. <laughs> That's the starting place, is that I am made in the image of God. And that person is made in the image of God, no matter what their race, no matter what their ethnic background is, no matter what their life experience is that they are made in the image of God. They reflect the likeness of God. They are of infinite worth and value. Anytime we devalue, denigrate, or discriminate against another person for any reason, it is an affront to the God who created them. The word for that is sin. Racism or any other form of denigration is a sin. And see, it's not just a social problem. This is so important because it's not just a social problem. One of the many social problems that somehow we need to figure out ways to address. This is a personal problem. This problem is personal to God. When we denigrate another person, when we discount When we devalue another person, it is personal to God. And God takes it personally. This matters. And see, the reason we don't get past these racial issues, it is not the pursuit of love. It is the pursuit of power that people are at. That those who have power don't want to give it up. Those who don't have it want to get it. And it becomes tension and racial battle for power instead of recognizing the value of every single individual made in the image of God, worthy of love. So secondly, how, do we, how does Paul address this? Paul, Paul says in the next verse, verse 28, he says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, what are you talking about, Paul? What do you mean? What do you mean that there's neither Jew nor Gentile? Of course there is. There's the Jews. There's the Gentiles. What do you mean that they're, they're not there? You can name them. And their status, for the Jews, the Jews are higher than the Gentiles. For the Gentiles, they're higher than the Jews. That there is a hierarchy, there is an understanding of how we relate, there is an understanding of the status that people, have, that people have. Jews would often say it's better to be born a dog than a Gentile. What do you mean there's no difference? What do you mean there's no difference between free and slave. Of course there is. Ask the slave if there's a difference between free and slave. Ask the free if there's a difference between free and slave. There is every bit of difference that we can imagine. What do you mean there's no difference between male and female? Not just anatomically, there is a difference in status and position and place. What do you mean in the first century Roman world and Jewish world there is no difference? And Paul is saying, yes, There are those worldly, arbitrary measurements. But in the eyes of God, there is no difference in value. There is no difference in dignity. There is no difference in worth. And so there may be ways that people relate out there, but when we come in here, that slave is infinite in value and worth every bit as much. Every bit as much as the one who is free that female to male. And Jesus modeled this. Jesus stunned people. Jesus created scandal after scandal because he kept reaching out to Gentiles, not just Jews. He kept reaching out to women, not just men. He kept reaching out to slaves, not just free people and people who had power. And the gospel today spreads like wildfire to those who are disenfranchised and on the outside. Why? Because Jesus is with them. Now, Paul addresses this in, even later in this uh, book. He says in chapter, Galatians chapter 6, verse 15, he says, Neither circumcision, Jews, or uncircumcision, Gentiles, means anything. What counts is the new creation. 
So what counts is a new creation. When Jesus rose from the dead, he inaugurated a new creation. He inaugurated a new reality of the kingdom of God where there is equality across the board that everybody values, everybody counts, everybody matters. And that he is calling us to live into this. Paul addressed this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he said, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. He died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. There's a resurrection. So because he's raised again from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view from the worldly measurements. Though we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You see, the resurrection of Jesus tells us that all are forgiven who place their trust in him. And as Jesus rose, that all who are in him rise with him. Not just when we die, we go to heaven. We rise with him into the reality of the kingdom that he has just established where every single person is made in the image of God and matters. No matter how the culture around them arbitrarily measures. He disbands the hostility. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes about this. He says, For Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, Jews and Gentiles, and has uh, made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with his commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. This is the new creation one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He put to death their hostility. Jesus' death on the cross is the death of racism among God's people. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by that one Holy Spirit. Do you know what happened at Pentecost? People from all the neighboring nations arrived in Jerusalem. Speaking different languages. Bringing different cultures. And the Holy Spirit fell. And God's people began to proclaim the wonders of God in different languages that the whole world, no matter where you were from, would hear the goodness and the love of God. It inaugurated a new day that we are called to live into. When I first moved to Cincinnati, where I was before here, in 1998, we had never lived in a Midwestern city, and, and Cincinnati uh, sat just north of the Ohio River. It was the gateway to the Underground Railroad. And it was there that slaves had come in. And when we moved there, we were uh, uh, interacting and, and enjoying getting to know the community. The community we're in where it was 50% white, 50% African American. And then one day in April 1999, there was a, a black teenager who was in a group and he just took off running when he saw a police officer. And he ran into an alley where there was no exit. And he turned around, not knowing what to do, he reached into his sweatpants. Now, I don't know what he was reaching for, but the officer didn't either. And what took place in that alleyway with the loss of the life of that teenager led to riots throughout the city. And this California kid who had never experienced anything like this was blown away. And I thought, here is the opportunity for the church to rise up and be the church, to model the way of how we can live together valuing. But just like today, it was on Sunday mornings were the most segregated hour of the week. 
there weren't relationships, but relationships began to form. A couple of years later, Billy Graham came and black and Hispanic and white churches came together to work in the city to address different challenges that were taking place, and we gathered together to hear the gospel as Billy Graham proclaimed it. And it was this picture of the united body of Christ in the midst of a divided city. And that's the picture we have to look forward to. Paul says that if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And he's pointing to the reality that one day, every nation, tribe, and tongue. In, in, in Revelation 7, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, one day Jesus is coming back. And he will consummate the reality of the kingdom of God. And the gathering isn't going to look like this. You know, what is heaven like? What language? What do people look like? What are the cultures? See, when Christ brings his people together, he doesn't eliminate the cultural, national, ethnic distinctiveness. He brings them together into a beautiful tapestry. He takes away the sin, and he brings people together to appreciate the uniqueness that each one brings. And all of a sudden, what happened at Pentecost goes to another level. And that becomes the new heaven and the new earth. Our call is either to live in the ways of the world now or to live in light of that reality that is coming. Let me give you just two quick ways. Number one, with all that is taking place in our world, when you hear something, when somebody says something, when you watch the news, and by the way, limit that, and something stirs up in you, what if our first response was to listen? What if we were to take a step back from our defensiveness our frustration and say this person sounds like they have a whole different life experience than me what if I take a step back from my defensiveness into the gospel in a way that says I want to hear their story and even approaching people and I've done this to say my experience is so different from yours I'd love to hear your experience and let people tell their stories I can't tell you the healing that can begin to take place if we start by listening. There's an old saying that says God's given us two ears and one mouth and we're to use them in that proportion. Our tendency is to be defensive and speak and take a, instead of taking a step back and listen. The second is to love. What if our posture is to overwhelm the hatred and the hostility with the same love that God has shown us? That when we get frustrated with somebody, no matter what the difference is, it might be racial, it might be ethnic, it might be cultural, it might be political, to have our first response instead of being, how can I push back? What if our first response is, how could I love that person today in a way they might not expect? What if those hostilities begin to come down? Because we choose to love instead of adding to the tension and the hostility. Because one day every nation, tribe, and tongue will gather together around the throne of Jesus and we'd say we would want it no other way. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, in Christ there is no east or west. There is no north or south. But you bring us together. Lord, I just want to ask that your Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday would meet us in the depth of our own heart. Who is the person, Lord? Or who are the people I struggle with most? 
Who are those I have least patience with or grow annoyed with? Who are those that I make assumptions about as like a broad paint stroke over, each, for, over everybody in, quote, unquote, that group? And Lord, would you transform our hearts? We just repent of our sin. Those seeds that maybe were planted by previous generations in our own heart. And give us an openness to listen and to love. Because Jesus is risen. That he's inaugurated a new day and we want nothing more than to be a part of that right now. So Lord, let us be part of the solution because Jesus, you have risen. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise and continue worshiping. Thank you for your patience as we address God's word today. A little longer than usual, but the urgency is so high. The call for us to live this out has never been higher, in, I don't think, in my lifetime. And yet, there is hope in this room. There is joy in this room. There is purpose in this room. And so this week, you will interact with those in your own house, in those in your neighborhood, in those on our streets and in your workplaces and wherever else you might be. There will be some that you're going to love to connect with, others that are going to annoy you to no end, others who bring a whole different perspective and background and life experience. And every single one of those people are opportunities that God is giving you to love, to listen to and love and in the process to learn. So let's be part of that solution because Jesus is risen. By the way, the session met this week also. And with all that is taking place in our culture and do we wear masks or not masks, um, we are moving to a place where masks are optional. Now, if you'd like to wear a mask and that is helpful for you, by all means, feel free to wear it. For whatever reason, and there are many great ones, if you prefer not to, especially if you've been vaccinated, then uh, feel free to not wear it. And that we will continue to love each other, because that's one of the other differences, right? Masks or not masks. Let's love each other in that as well as we continue our ministry together, because he is able. He is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine according to his power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you.